Hey, uh, good morning. And Kriana, thank you for joining us for the second half of the session, Alaska Museums and Artists Respond to the COVID-19 um, Pandemic. Um, I'm Amy Phillips-Chan, and although we're um, zooming in kind of from all over the circumpolar north uh, this morning, uh, I do want to acknowledge that I'm um, coming from uh, Sitnesok, which and the town of Nome, where I'm fortunate to live and work here on the traditional homelands of the Nupiat. And um, thank you to all of our session um, presenters and to the audience for joining us. And I am going to turn it over now to uh, Sonia Keller Combs, as well as uh, Maureen Grubin uh, for their presentation. So Sonia, if you wanna go ahead and um, share your screen, that would be great. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, good morning. My name is uh, Sonia Kelleher Combs, and I'm an artist, and um, I live in Anchorage. And I want to begin by acknowledging the land um, on which I live, the home of the Denina Athabascan people, and thank them for their stewardship of this beautiful place. And um, I am an artist who grew up in Nome, Alaska. Um, my father is from Utkiavik and my mother is from Nulato. And um, my family cultures and relationship to land are, are really um, important to me and influence all that I do. And it's because of this that I live and work in Alaska. And I would first like to also thank the three organizations who help support the distance residency from the body, land, sea, and air. Um, the Inuit Arts Foundation, the Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center, and the Nordic Lab and Saw Gallery. And lastly, I want to say a big thank you to my uh, collaborator and partner, um, Maureen Grubin. Um, her work and her way of life are truly inspiring. So let's move to our next slide here. So in March of 20, I'm going to give you a quick overview of what exactly our distance residency was and um, how it came about. Um, so in March of 2020, Maureen and I were set to embark on a reciprocal artist exchange uh, program uh, through the Inuit Arts Foundation Circumpolar Exchange Program. Due to global health concerns and travel restrictions, an already long journey uh, became impossible. So Everybody knows there is a pandemic on and um, it actually, Maureen was set to come here on March 20th and our borders were shut on March 18th. So we, um, we met and um, via phone and uh, we talked about, you know, we were so excited about it, we decided to continue on. So we decided to, to stay in touch and um, and we started a collaboration from a distance. Uh, we did, we called it a distance residency. So um, on the left is, um, as we started to document and share imagery as well, besides conversation and writing too. So this on the left is a picture from the beach in Kasilov where my husband and I spend a good portion of our summer um, gathering fish and processing fish and um, all the things that um, we do on the land, so. Um, Maureen, you want to talk a little bit about, um, you want to introduce yourself? And... Sure. My name is Maureen Grubin. I'm a contemporary artist living here in my home, hometown of Tuktuyaktuk. And um, it was such a pleasure to, to work with Sonia and to actually spend time in Alaska. This was, I think, two years ago mm -hmm. when we first met. And, um, and to continue our, our relationship through art and our land and, and our environment. So this is uh, just a great, great way to, to continue this relationship. Yeah. You wanna tell us a little bit about this, this image? This piece was in the first week in June, when the ice was just moving out of the harbor, 
um, out into what we call um, the point. And it's a spit that juts around the, the harbor. So when the ice breaks up, there's just this one or two days where you can catch the ice really shifting and moving. And I was fortunate enough to um, to document this, the sound and uh, take a few videos. So this is me standing on some ice in quite uh, deep water, it would have been over my knees, but I stepped onto a little ice pan. Mm -hmm. And um, so I could get the sound a lot more clearly. So I did a sound piece for um, a Nuit Blanche for our Toronto. And they have the, the sound piece right now, but it, it's just amazing to listen to the candle ice move. It's a beautiful piece. Maybe some, maybe we can figure out how to share that sometime. Yes. So me, yeah. Oh no, what's going on? Why isn't it moving? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, okay so um, I began to start collecting stuff from <clears throat> from the land. The irony is. Maureen and I were both were collecting things and, and I ended up collecting all mostly um, man-made objects that had been littering our beach and, and the nature. And so this is the very first piece I, is, I started calling them found artifacts. So it's lost, discarded or liberated, luxury worn raw, once snowy white, weathered gray, return a new life to come. And then I would bring them back to my studio I, I converted a little, we have a little guest cabin at our camp and um, I converted it into a studio where I worked for the um, summer. So I began to catalog them too, which is something I've never done before. Um, you know, writing the day I found it, um, um, documenting it, um, thinking about it as literally an artifact. And so let me see if I can change it again. There we go. <laughs> um, so this is new artifact. So I was transforming them. Um, and I, this one is a documentation of how long COVID has been in our state. Um, so it's over 300 days, now, well, 350, close to 300. Well, it's almost a whole year that COVID has been here. So I was making a stitch on this piece for every day that COVID is here. I'm also doing some other pieces about the people we've lost here as well, so. Okay, this is Maureen. So this was um, taken in a place where we go every year to, to fish um, for lake trout and it's called Husky Lakes. But this particular place is called Kikugiwak is where I have my tent frame and we just, or just starting to build a, a little cabin there. And I adopted a Garrett who is now 13. And this is his sister, biological sister that we took out camping with us. And it was her first time camping. So when she seen what the, the ptarmigan were eating, she started walking around the tundra and picking these, these willow buds that um, she thought might attract the ptarmigan. And, and um, gather around her tent. So this is a picture I took of her. It's so lovely. And this is her brother Garrett, whom we adopted. And um, they, him and his two younger siblings um, just learned that you can actually chew on candle ice. They didn't know that it was, um, didn't have any salt. So this was a, a new experience for them. We were every spring, at, um, the students here are hired to, to clean the community. And that's why he's wearing rubber gloves. We're actually picking garbage on the beach. And, um, and then I explained to him that you can actually drink or chew on this fresh ice, even though it's from the ocean. Wow, that's beautiful. Okay. So um, this new series of work, I've done over 200 of these now, 
from the body um, is a series that like the day after the pandemic first came to Alaska, which was March 13th, I started collecting my hair after I took a shower. And um, I, I collect my hair always and most of, you know, I, I use a hair a lot, but I'd never done it in such a documentary way. I started to catalog it and each um, little pile of hair became a hair, a hair drawing, a hair portrait of each, you know, representing each day. And um, I, there aren't 350, there aren't the number of days because I don't take a shower every day. That's one good thing with COVID. I don't feel like I have to take a shower every day. Uh, but um, another thing is speaking to kind of the fragility and the vulnerability that I felt after, you know, I realized after COVID came here, we didn't, I think somehow in my mind it was gonna go away, but, um, and also talking with other artists, artists like Amy Meisner, she, we were in a show together in October and she talked about how she had cut her hair and her hair had been a little bit longer. And she said, I'm losing my hair, you know, from this. And I was like, me too, I've never lost so much hair. So um, the, the effects of this, um, just on our physical body, even not having COVID, I think um, our emotional um, well-being as well. So, um, and a lot of times the way I think about my art is, a, a, I'm collecting things all the time and people are sending me things they think that somehow I might use. And so um, the kind of content and the actual physical making of, of objects and, and artworks sometimes takes a really long time. Um, I, I'll live with an object for sometimes years before I know what I'm gonna do with it. And even the content, you know, like what, what it's about, even if I have an idea kind of what it's about, it doesn't, it takes a, a while to flush that out and um, really kind of speak to, uh, and, and it changes over time, you know, and people bring their own content to the work as well. So it can be very subjective. So Tether, this new, new artifact, um, this rope came early in the spring and it just stayed in the yard. I didn't know what I wanted to do with it for a long time. But when I started doing these hair drawings, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I was gonna make this, um, make this rope and this tether um, into something that had showed it, it metaphorically was for a connection to each other, even though we were far apart, um, to the land, to community. Um, and also talking about, like, you know, the limits of our um, ability to, to cope during this really trying time. Sonia, does it have your hair wrapped around it? Yeah, that's hair. I stitched oh, it all on there. I, yeah. I only noticed it now. You didn't list the... Um, oh, the materials. The materials. Yeah. Amazing. That's my, it reminds that's my me hair of, um, stitched on there seal in her blood that I made with uh, seal skin and red mm -hmm. velvet. Okay. There's so much but, correlation between our work. There really is. Yeah, it's it's just, we're almost on the same postal yeah. wavelength. We're, we're being <laughs> <each other. laughs> we're tethered. <laughs> we're tethered, exactly. <laughs> so again, this is just harvesting from the land in our like seasonal harvest. Um, subsistence lifestyle and this was an elder that um, came with me to go up we call it upland it's just going up the road a bit it used to be the end of the road but now that we have an all-weather access road which connects us to the rest of the world we, we can go as far as we want now but we just go to the spot where we're not picking or plucking in the town so mm -hmm. the feathers don't get all over the place so we go upland and um, this is where we were just plucking our geese and um, preparing them to put away for the winter. It's beautiful. But it was so funny because, um, you know, we're just covered in feathers from head to toe, our hair and everything. And then you look up and you see these beautiful patterns of geese flying overhead. And here you are harvesting the geese. It's, it's such a beautiful time of the year. 
something that I think is really lovely is that, I mean, Dawn talked a little bit about it in the previous, in her session about, or and Melissa too, about not doing things in the summer because those are the times that we, that are important for us to harvest our foods. So we all get, kind of get together in the winter time. I just said my internet is unstable. So, so this piece was found at, again at the point and the, the real thing is the coastal erosion that's happened along this, this point, this spit, because what you see here used to be at least five feet high with, uh, with beautiful rocks. And, um, and now it's flat as a pancake and it's, it's completely split apart and, and now we're open to the ocean because we don't have that protection of the, the, the point we call the point. So I was walking along and I, I found many artifacts along this beach before and um, didn't think there was anything more because it's really not much of a beach anymore because of the coastal erosion. And I was very surprised to find this piece uh, of a fishing spear. It's really beautiful. Thank you. So um, as, as I was walking on the beach, you know, it's like you see these things and um, I, I found this piece, it's, it's really actually quite large, it's like I want to say eight feet or thereabouts, maybe even longer. Um, and I had my husband put it in the truck and hauled it back to our cabin and um, it became an artifact number two. So I brought it home and um, I kept on thinking about, you know, what, how long had been out there, what had happened, you know, where it was originally, you know. And then I began to think about Maureen's fishing spear and that's kind of, you know, um, and then I began to think about, you know, my father had given me this, it's an old artifact. Um, and he, he gave it to me when I was a child and he told me, he said, this will make you strong because I was afraid to go to school. And mm -hmm. thinking of the strength of our, you know, of, of these objects and, you know, that they have this beautiful history and so I brought it home and I started um, to think of our material culture um, and um, I began to carve on this artifact number two. And as I cut the driftwood, I thought of a young Yupik man. His name is Oscar Golga, who was, um, who I met. He was going to school at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. And I was doing this community outreach residency, um, and community engagement, I think is what they called it. And one of the things I did was I brought students into collections. There's a bunch of museums in Santa Fe and I brought them into this collection and I, I'll never forget it. Um, it was his first time he'd ever been to a museum and he saw many objects from his culture and he called them my ancestors in a box. And it was very emotional. And it reminded me of being a kid back in Nome and going to our museum and, and seeing all these objects cased away. I also began to think about how something becomes precious once it's buried in the ground and how um, from another perspective, from a Western perspective, um, it um, is collected and revered and given value, a monetary value. And, um, and it's the same way that they've been assigning value to indigenous cultures for hundreds of years and controlling the narrative and history of our people. That was something else I've been thinking about a lot actually. And so, you know, I applaud all these organizations, the three that I mentioned earlier that are doing this great work that um, are engaging our, our people, allowing them voice, you know, it's really important putting them on, you know, having cultural committees and advisors and all of that, employing our people, letting them share their stories. Can you just go back to yours? It reminds me of so many things like a bowhead, um, 
a bowhead rib or yeah. a tooth or because you can't tell the scale of it right yeah it's like eight feet long and yeah those uh, those circles are like this big wow. yeah and, and actually you said that bowhead did you see the little poem i have on there with it it says it's from the land via the sea an artifact fact hidden in plain sight relations to the bowhead ages mm -hmm. filled with strength and wisdom shh if we are quiet there are stories and lessons to learn so yeah. beautiful and those markings when you look at um, our ancestral artifacts you see a lot of those circular markings on their combs the ulu handles any ornaments and um it's a very common mark yeah so beautiful allowing the spirit to go, mm -hmm. to go back you know i don't know i'm looking at my timer I, and we might be getting soon huh we're, okay. we're out of time ladies yeah okay <laughs> i'll just go through this real quick here there's this is so amazing this is maureen's and we'll just show some pictures of our fishing This is where I spent my summer. You're going to come here, Maureen. And that's where I'm going to go. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both Maybe so much. With our picture, Sonia. One more, one more slide. Oh, oh one more. That's right. This that's one. Yeah. Thank you. These, these <laughs> that's right. These polar bear pants. They're the range. My mom made them, by the way. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. Okay. Thanks Excellent. For I'm stop sharing. Okay. Thanks so much to you both. And uh, for those in our audience, um, please check out the webs or the links and the chat box if you'd like to learn some more about Sonia and Maureen and their amazing artwork. So up next, uh, we're going to transition to uh, Haley Chambers uh, with the Ketchikan Museums uh, for her presentation. So Haley, if you want to, there you go, and go ahead and start uh, sharing your screen. Perfect. Excellent. So everybody can see it. I got married um, in the midst of the pandemic this past fall. Um, when Tommy's mom attempted to buy flowers for the wedding, a local shop owner refused to take the order because it was for same-sex marriage. Um, the incident led to public protests and after months of uh, public commentary, um, it eventually led to the creation of an equal rights ordinance, um, which was passed um, by both the city of Ketchikan and the borough. Um, and with the passage of that ordinance, Ketchikan became the fourth Alaskan city to ban discrimination against LGBTQ individuals. Um, so what looks like a playful wedding picture really was a historic moment for our community. Um, and it helps fill a gap in our records um, on social justice and diversity. Um, so starting a few years ago, our collecting practices began to shift. Um, like most museums, we're really happy to collect things that are offered to us. Um, and now we are very actively um, seeking out materials. Um, and our goal is to fill in gaps in the collection and to represent uh, current moments uh, in Ketchikan's history for people of the future. So today I'm gonna talk about um, developing a rapid response collecting strategy, collecting methods and logistics, um, lessons that we've learned along the way, and hopefully time will allow me to share some photos of the cool things that we've collected this past year. Um, this is an evolving process for us, um, and we're still figuring out solutions that work for our organization. Um, it's really important that I emphasize that what I'm going to share today, there are things that work for us in Ketchikan, our community, our institution, um, and I, I hope you'll be able to take what you can um, and use that, adapt it to your community's needs. Um, so before beginning um, a collecting campaign, I highly, highly recommend questioning whether or not a collection response is appropriate. Um, I think it's especially important when collecting from a traumatic experience. Um, so I've developed this set of questions uh, to help with the decision-making process. Um, so first and foremost, does it fit our mission? Is the event important for the historical record of the community? 
Do we have the resources for potential long-term care? How soon is too soon to collect? Who are our community stakeholders? Are there legal or ethical issues? How do we keep staff and existing collections safe? How much do we collect? What type of materials um, are we looking for? Um, and after deciding that, you know, we do want to proceed with a collecting campaign, then it's time to start thinking more specifics. So questions that you might ask, um, what do you want to collect and how are you going to do it? Um, how are you going to communicate the needs um, to the public? And then once we have things, how are we going to determine what's appropriate for the collection? Um, so within the first couple months of the pandemic, we decided that we wanted to collect both physical and digital artifacts, um, as well as oral history interviews. So we created um, a list of things that we were interested in. And, you know, as the year progressed, we added to that list. Um, I'm not going to read these all out, um, but you can see it, it was a lot of um, material and, you know, we're open to, um, to new things that people had presented us to. Um, because we were close to the public for a couple of months early on, um, we communicated with people on the phone, um, through social media, and through our website. Um, and this is a, a portal. Um, we created a special portal on our website to, um, to talk about our oral history project and provide a way for people to share. Um, things online easily with us. Um, and by the summer, we um, had engaged local press for some free publicity. Um, and here, uh, we used a monthly column that I write for the local newspaper to highlight a recent um, COVID donation. And um, we also went on the radio to share a historical story um, about the Spanish flu of 1918. Um, and here is a little bit more of a breakdown of our process and some of the things that we learned along the way. Um, so be ready with paperwork um, to track new things coming into the museum. We use a temporary custody receipt. So this form records what is being offered, who is offering it and what we can do with the offer. And for the most part, our donations are really straightforward. Um, but for the past couple of years, uh, we decided to create a, a new temporary custody number at the beginning of the year. And we hold, that, um, we hold that number open for the whole year. And staff is encouraged to add things uh, throughout the year. And then at our last monthly collections meeting, um, we assess those things. Um, some get accessioned into the permanent collection, some things are declined, some things go into our research files. Um, and then we have a box uh, for some things that we're not sure about, um, but we keep an inventory and we keep those things on hand for future assessment. Um, another great thing is to provide examples of what you're looking for. And I'm gonna talk about that more um, on my next slide. Um, then making sharing easy. Um, kind of a firm believer that if it's easy, uh, people are more likely to do it. Um, so we're experimenting with converting some of our forms into fillable PDFs. Um, and that allows people to complete our paperwork virtually. Um, and we also utilize a share site um, that's kind of similar to Dropbox, uh, but it's approved by our IT department. And that allows people to upload content to us um, where they don't have to physically come into the museum and, and interact with us. Um, working with existing connections has been a really um, important one for us. Um, pretty early on, I realized that I wasn't going to be everywhere um, and be aware of everything that was going on. Um, so I've had to rely on my coworkers and um, their personal connections uh, in the community, as well as um, our museum advisory board members um, to just really, again, help make connections and um, to help uh, kind of enlighten me on different opportunities that might be available in the community. Um, and lastly, um, this is kind of a no brainer, but I, I thought it was important to point out um, how important it is to follow um, health and safety guidelines, um, especially, you know, dealing with a pandemic and potentially contaminated items. 
it's really important to prioritize um, staff safety and um, for us to stay current on um, health and safety guidelines. Um, and generally with new donations coming in, we quarantine them anyways, um, but for COVID, you know, we really made sure to isolate materials and um, in some instances we, we froze some things. Um, so I mentioned on the last slide that I wanted to talk about an example, um, and this was actually something that I had learned from another museum's webinar, um, and that was um, being able to share a great example of what you're looking for with the community, um, because it helps take away the intimidation factor um, for some people. Um, so this was a really fun one. Um, uh, to create a, an activity for families during the quarantine, um, community members hid teddy bears uh, for people to discover while they were out on their walks or driving around town. Um, and one woman, uh, she put out um, eight bears. She made signs, she gave them names. And um, after a couple of months, uh, it was incredible that any had survived our <laughs> rainy catch again weather, um, but Nurse Cares a Lot, which is the one at the um, bottom right corner, um, ended up getting donated. And we've been using that for a lot of our publicity, um, again, to just give people an idea of some of the things that we're looking to collect. Um, so this project um, has been really interesting. Um, we've learned a lot over the past year. Um, and um, I wanted to share just a few of our successes and some of the challenges. Um, so success-wise, um, I'm really grateful to have a strong uh, collecting committee um, of fellow coworkers. Um, we are able to have uh, great conversations and really dive deep into critical issues on what we're interested in collecting. Um, this year has also been great for building relationships, um, strengthening some of our existing relationships, but also um, being able to connect with people that haven't traditionally been involved with the museum. Um, again, utilizing local publicity was a really big bonus for us. Um, a lot of people were um, looking to hear news that had a um, more positive, more interesting slant than just talking about the growing COVID numbers. Um, again, also working our connections um, and also realizing that, um, you know, we might be collecting a whole lot of stuff, um, but we don't need to actually collect everything that is out there. Um, and some of the challenges that we learned, um, and we're still learning, <laughs> is um, there are things that, you know, I, I think it's my boss who's been saying this a lot of, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And um, we're continuing to learn throughout this whole process. Um, and certainly with the pandemic, there's a lot of things that are still in use. Um, business signs, face masks, things like that. Um, and, and we've reached out to a variety of different people and just let them know like, hey, we're, you know, we're really interested in this thing. Um, when it's no longer useful for you, um, think of us. Um, we'll be open to having a conversation, you know, when you're ready for that. Um, also allowing time for follow-up. Um, that's, that's been a hard one for me because we've gone through periods of being open to the public um, and then being closed to the public. So um, allowing time for me to adjust to those different demands. Um, also, and a really surprising one for me was like educating the community that we do collect contemporary issues. Um, that was a big thing of just letting people know that, you know, we don't just talk, we don't just take in things that represent old history. We're very, very much active and out there and trying to document what's happening now. Um, Another thing to be really aware of is um, that there might be financial uh, resources that um, could be involved, you know, certain things that we might want to purchase or supplies that might have an added expense. Um, and then another one for me, and this was a kind of a hard learning lesson, was just um, being able to take care of myself because I would get pretty burned out um, on social media and trying to document, um, you know, the variety of things that I was seeing from businesses and, and individuals. 
Um, so I'm just going to kind of quickly run through some of the cool things that we've collected. Um, and, and again, I really want to emphasize, you know, these are these are things that have really strong Ketchikan stories and connections um, and things that will hopefully last beyond um, the pandemic. Um, but we've, we've worked really closely with the Emergency Operations Command and this was the, um, this is the entity that's um, watching over our community and helping to keep everybody safe. Um, and we've been collecting a variety of digital content from them of, you know, their, their daily media releases and situation reports um, and different advertising they put out um, to their um, PSAs that have gone on the radio and also some signage um, that went out um, around the community. Um, we've also been um, trying to document the process of, of businesses and kind of what they've been going through. Um, some longstanding businesses like um, AJ's Gourmet Burgers, um, they've been around for a long time um, and just how they've responded immediately to the pandemic um, to a new, a newer business, um, Skylar's Table. Um, they actually opened at the end of 2019 and um, they uh, very quickly had to pivot their operations to, um, to accommodate what was happening with the pandemic. Uh, uh, Ketchikan is very much known as being a fantastic arts community and um, there was definitely no shortage of phenomenal art that was created. Um, so some really wonderful digital art, um, some amazing photography, things with humor um, were really big here um, to kind of help lighten the severity of the situation. Um, and then also indigenous art um, and incorporating language. Um, that was another big trend that we saw. Um, and then there were other kind of formats of art that were really interesting. Um, one of our local artists, Brooke Ratzat, um, she is more of a photographer and she had an exhibit opening at our local arts council um, in April. And she had to completely pivot her um, presentation to a virtual format and engaging um, different elements of the community um, to make her show a success. Um, and then of course, um, you know, music and TikTok videos um, have been really interesting um, way for people to respond to the pandemic. Um, masks, <laughs> it's sort of mask galore with, um, with our community. Um, and again, you know, really, really emphasizing our Ketchikan connections. Um, we have a local print shop uh, and they've been printing masks for the canneries, for social groups, for businesses. And, you know, we're slowly trying to collect those things. Um, we're collecting artistic masks um, like the beaded um, blueberry mask. Um, and another really cool donation that we got uh, was from our local theater group for the First City Players. They, um, they did an adaptation of the longest running show in Ketchikan um, this past summer, and they made custom uh, masks for their performance and then donated them to us after, after the show. Um, and, you know, one of, um, one of the questions that has come up a lot is sort of like, how much do we collect? And, um, with certain things, we've, we've tried to limit, you know, the amount of signs, but also capture, you know, how things have changed around the community. So these, these are just a handful of photos that I've taken that kind of show some of the interesting things that have happened in the community. Um, there's also been a lot of ephemera that's been generated. So uh, grocery store advertisements, coloring pages, um, stimulus checks um, and the, the stimulus debit card that came out, um, community cookbook that um, one organization put together to help provide a little bit of joy uh, for the community. 
Um, we've also been documenting um, events that might have been canceled or altered. Um, you know, so a lot of a lot of you will probably find a lot of uh, comfort in the Zoom uh, photos and. Um, you know, our local pioneer home, they have done a really wonderful job of adapting uh, for uh, their um, residents. Another area that was impacted, certainly education and the high school and how, um, you know, especially seniors, their senior year changed. So there was a lot of signs that went up around town um, to help uh, support the senior class and then you know their graduation at the dock and their virtual prom. Um, another big thing was sort of politics and protesting over this past year uh, was a very powerful movement. A lot of people had a lot of things to say. Um, the marine quarantine flags. Um, this was a, a gill netter that came up from Washington State and this man had been fishing in our waters for about 35 years and this is the first time he's ever had to quarantine. Um, so that was really interesting getting that story. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. so sorry to interrupt. <laughs> we have run out of time. Okay. I cool. love all the examples that you are sharing. They're so amazing. <laughs> well, cool. Um, thank you for cutting me off. <laughs> and, um, I'm always happy to answer questions um, that anybody might have. So um, please feel free to reach out to me at the museum if you've got questions. Awesome. Wonderful. Cool. Thank you for that great presentation. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. All right, uh, we're going to transition now uh, to our next presentation, uh, which I have the honor of presenting uh, with, uh, with my colleague, um, colleague R.B. Smith uh, from the Gnome Nugget newspaper. R.B., do you wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen, please? Sure, yeah. Awesome, thanks. So while he's getting that uh, ready, just a good morning again, everybody. And Kiana, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name's Amy Phillips Chan. I serve as the director here at the Carrie McLean Museum. Um, and with me is my colleague, R.B. Smith, who is a reporter for the Gnome Nugget newspaper. And we're both zooming in from the snow covered tundra of Sitnesok um, in the town of Gnome, which we are very fortunate to live and, and work here um, on the traditional homeland of the Anupiat people. Um, so just to briefly kind of um, contextualize the project, um, on March 12th of last year, the city of Nome held a public meeting where community members stood shoulder to shoulder and urged our city council to basically close the town in a proactive measure against the COVID-19 virus. It was feared uh, the new coronavirus would um, arrive with hundreds of visitors who were flying into Nome over the next week to see Iditarod racers cross the finish line. So during this meeting, um, community members shared um, really painful recollections of the 1918 influenza that had swept across the Seward Peninsula and decimated um, many of our Nupiak families. So soon after that meeting, um, local organizations began to close um, to the public, including the Carrie McLean Museum. And like many at that time, we did not know um, how long we would be closed for or really how the pandemic was going to unfold. However, um, there was a glaring absence of personal accounts from 1918, uh, particularly those from indigenous community members, uh, which prompted the launch of an oral history project and an artwork initiative um, that has become structured by a series of partnerships between the museum, the Gnome Nugget newspaper, community members, and um, artists uh, from the Bering Strait region. So here to share about the oral history portion of the project uh, is R.B. Smith, who has been covering the pandemic since the beginning for the Gnome Nugget and um, has come on board as a research collaborator with the museum. So R.B. Yeah, so uh, yeah, thank you for that, for that introduction. Um, I'll just sort of run through quickly what we did, um, what we felt like was effective, what we felt like could have done differently. Um, yeah, so we we end up doing twenty. I end up doing twenty interviews uh, in the fall, sort of from, from September through November. Um, they were about forty five minutes to an hour each, um, and then I also took photos and were collecting sort of other contextual photos from the interviewees 
and then wrote up transcripts and then edited those transcripts down into smaller sort of essays that um, will go into some kind of publication or uh, exhibit sort of once we're on the other side of all of this. Um, I had never done oral history before. You know, I, my background is in newspaper reporting, um, but the Ketchikan Museum, um, who we just heard from actually was an awesome resource and sort of getting my head around what kind of questions to ask. And likewise, the um, Vermont Folklife Center has some great resources on how to do oral history. But mostly I just sort of started out chronologically, you know, asking people how they felt at the beginning and how their opinions about the pandemic have changed. Um, I asked sort of questions about their life and their work and their family and, and how the pandemic has affected their lives. And then ended with some sort of more open-ended questions, um, what they thought about what would happen in the future and what any message they'd like to, to put for people in Nome 100 years from now, because like Dr. Chan said, you know, a big impetus to this project was that we didn't have a lot of firsthand accounts of people from 100 years ago. And so we'd like to, you know, in 20, in, 2120, um, you know, maybe maybe give people with a little more a little more resources. Um, so to get people, we wanted you know to open this up to anyone in the community. So we posted on Facebook and we put up flyers, sort of in community gathering places. Um, and we didn't end up getting a ton of responses. Um, so I also started reaching out to community members, trying to sort of you know get like a wide range of age. Um, different sort of occupations, roles in the community, um, a racial balance that matched the, the racial balance of the community um, and ended up getting 20 people to sit down with me. Um, definitely it's skewed towards more community leaders. Um, part of that was maybe just sort of my instinct as a reporter, sort of going to the people who were in charge. Um, and also I think that allowed us to sort of get a clear picture on how larger sort of institutions in Nome um, we're dealing with the pandemic, but uh, sort of looking back on it, I'll admit that um, we probably got more leadership role in the community and fewer people that, you know, regular nomites um, that perhaps could be something that could be addressed in, in future, future research projects. Um, interviewing people was sort of a challenge um, because of the pandemic, you know, for my newspaper work, I pretty much do everything over the phone. Um, but I gave people the option of meeting with me in person for this project because the, the conversations I felt would be more sort of person, person to person and people would talk more, which was actually the case. Um, some people wanted to speak with me on the phone or on Zoom, and that was a great option as well. Um, and other people wanted to meet with the outside, which was another good sort of way to keep things safe, although that got harder as we got later in the year and it got colder. Um, for me, I always wore a mask and stood six feet away from people, but not everyone that I interviewed wanted to wear a mask. Um, and while that was sort of uncomfortable at first, I ultimately just sort of let people do what, what they felt was most comfortable for them. Um, and then the final products, you know, we use Temi with transcription software to get full transcripts of the entire um, interviews. And then I'm in the process of editing them down to sort of one page um, essays that capture sort of what the, the person was saying that can ultimately go into an exhibition or publication. Um, and the goal, um, I know that another community member is in the process of conducting another round of interviews this spring because a lot has changed since from the fall to now. Um, and the ideas for the transcripts and the audios to be available in the museum for anyone to access down the line. And now I'm working on a project sort of looking at remembrance of the 1918 pandemic, um, how it affected the community then and how that affects uh, people's responses to 2020. So then I'll, I'll hand it back to Dr. Chan and she can talk about the art projects. Great, thanks RB, that was perfect. Um, so now I'm going to briefly share about the COVID-19 artwork initiative, um, including some goals for the project as well as some challenges um, while undertaking kind of collaborative programming uh, during a pandemic. So the art initiative is really striving to create opportunities for our artists from, um, from the region to, to create work um, at this time, and also to create work that reflects or responds to the pandemic kind of on their own terms. So artists are invited to submit a sketch or a brief description of their proposed piece, um, or we're happy to you know, kind of visit about it on the phone. But there are really no kind of subject or material um, limitations. So project scope and budget has allowed us to invite approximately a dozen artists um, to participate. 
And this has required a really kind of thoughtful approach um, to who we reach out to, as we want to include a broad range of communities, heritage, gender, age, and um, artistic medium. So not every artist we initially reached out to um, decided to participate. So we've had to try to connect with um, other artists while still keeping that diversity piece in mind, uh, which has provided, you know, it's, it's proved a bit of a challenge. Um, because we've started this project, project during the pandemic, um, we've also had to be flexible in how we can communicate with our project partners. Um, whereas, especially locally, we would meet in person. Now we've been doing phone calls, emails, Zoom, and you know, messages uh, via Facebook. But it was important from the beginning um, that the artwork be framed from the artist's unique perspective or experience of the pandemic. So artists have been um, sharing their voices, their thoughts through kind of informal interviews or conversations, which have been held over the phone and via Zoom, as well as uh, provided written statements um, that will accompany their pieces. So some of the artists' thoughts are gonna be quoted in this presentation um, in conjunction with their artwork. And so now, Arby, if you wanna do the next slide, I'm going to share a few pieces that have been submitted for the project. And while the majority of these pieces were commissioned, um, some of the, the photographs that you're gonna see um, had been taken actually prior to the launch of the project. And um, the artists donated digital copies uh, to the museum, which has been really wonderful. So um, here we have a, a Nupiak elder, uh, Joseph Kunik Sr., um, who grew up um, on Ukiadvik on King Island, uh, where he fondly recalls hunting for myrrh eggs among the cliffs. So Joe and his wife, Mary, uh, live here in Nome, surrounded by their children and grandchildren. And Joe has been carving ivory for over 70 years. Um, for this project, Joe envisioned a family continuing their traditional activities despite the pandemic. So the wife and husband um, on this large piece in the back are, posi are positioned uh, six inches apart on a walrus tusk to symbolize the, the distancing, social distancing of six feet. The son and daughter um, are dancing and wearing kerchiefs over their mouths, uh, which is a repurposed use of the um, headscarf that many Inupiaq women uh, traditionally wore. The ivory mask at the front there um, looms larger than life as a symbol of its dominance within our new world. Okay, next. Thanks. Um, uh, these are a couple of amazing masks uh, by Marjorie Kunak um, Tabone. Um, Kunak has a wide range of talents and skills centering on her Anupiaq and Kiowa heritage. Uh, she was raised at her family fish camp outside of Nome, and um, Kunak uses resources from the land to create her art. For this project, uh, Kunak chose to create two masks, utilizing materials and skills that she already had on hand. Uh, for family protection, which is the mask on the left, um, she paired her fa family's kupak design of black and white calfskin um, with uh, ground squirrel skins, um, which is kind of an acknowledgement of uh, traditional fancy parkas that um, seamstresses use to both show off their skills and to kind of express their love for their family. Ceremonial healing on the right uh, features alder dyed seal skin uh, that Kuna uh, hand tanned along with beadwork in a style um, that she found on some heritage items in a book and that spoke to her kind of about um, the healing of ceremony. So some great pieces. Um, next, please. So transitioning now from kind of some traditional materials or natural materials to um, photography. Um, these are a couple images uh, taken by Michael Burnett. Um, Michael moved to Nome in 2015. And one of his favorite things to shoot or capture was the Iditarod every year. And when Iditarod week in Nome was pretty much effectively canceled um, in 20, um, 2020, a friend reached out to him with the idea to organize a um, shoot called On the Porch, which at that time was a movement kind of sweeping across the lower 48. So Michael shared the opportunity on Facebook and within a couple of days had over a dozen families uh, requesting uh, photographs. So some of these images that Michael captured offer an intimate glimpse um, into the pandemic kind of during the first few weeks, such as the picture on the right, 
of Ruth Ann Glazier and her two daughters, um, while others are kind of captured the creativity and, and maybe the fighting spirit of Gnome, um, these kind of like stage tableaus, such as this kind of 1920s recreation um, of Jackie um, Reader and Emily Hofstetter um, there at the top. So next, please. So in contrast to kind of these um, staged uh, photographs, um, uh, photographer and mayor, John Handelin of Nome um, has been taking a series of photographs um, called uh, Masked People. So John grew up in Nome and uh, he has, he's been capturing images of the community really since high school and he pretty much knows everybody here in Nome. Um, and he's taken over 200 um, images or snapshots of ma masked people while they shop for groceries, wait to board an airplane or kind of stand in line uh, to get tested for COVID-19. Uh, these informal portraits are posted and shared on Facebook and really kind of offer a visual history or micro history into the daily lives of nomites during the pandemic. Great, next please. Um, so this is uh, an amazing piece by an amazing painting by uh, writer Kibitorik Eriksson. Um, writer is uh, an Inupiaq and Norwegian artist uh, who lives in Unalakleet with his wife Annette um, and their three children. Uh, writer works primarily in acrylic paints and he is known for his kind of use of bold colors and these dreamlike landscapes to express the beauty of Northern Alaska and really the resourcefulness uh, of the people who live here. So the painting he created uh, for the initiative is titled Quality Time. And it shows a family um, at fish camp working side by side as they sew mukluks, mend a net and uh, till a garden. So writer really wanted to focus on a positive aspect of the pandemic and for his family, this meant um, additional time for subsistence activities and uh, learning from elders at home. Okay, next please. So another um, great piece, actually it's, a, it's become a series, um, has been done by Karen Olana. Um, she's a multimedia artist uh, who works in bone and bronze and oil paints, but is perhaps best known for her kind of woodblock prints that feature these really bold lines and intertwined imagery. So her piece, Pandemic Response, shown here, um, underwent a transformation uh, this past year, kind of in response to her um, emotive state. So the piece on the left represents um, an initial response to the pandemic, um, kind of as an existential idea um, about this kind of unbelievable lockdown that was happening you know, across, across the world. Uh, the middle piece shows the earth kind of red hot as the virus becomes real and crosses oceans. And the piece on the right depicts hope after the vaccination, but there's a surrealism to the colors as the world and normalcy have changed. So we're super happy, Sonia, or Sonia, Karen, um, just brought those pieces in um, last week. So we're really happy to kind of now see this kind of transformation um, that she's worked through. Um, next slide, please, RB. Thank you. Um, so as Arby mentioned at the beginning, um, the COVID-19 project really has kind of three phases. Um, we're kind of in phase two, which is uh, additional oral histories. And Carol Gales, who is in the audience, has come on board the project and is going to be kind of working um, and listening to community members, our post um, peak phase, which happened in November, and then kind of what that experience was like. Um, we're also working with additional artists in this phase two. Uh, you can see some of them there on the screen. Mark Tetpon um, just actually submitted his, an image of his piece to me last night of his awesome hoop mask with that Anupiak tune um, mask um, over the face there. So phase three is planning to get underway this summer and involves exhibit development with our project contributor. So really kind of collaborative development. Um, and will be accompanied by a digital publication, which kind of RB spoke to. The project has emphasized the importance of longitudinal relationships, uh, particularly when you are attempting to jumpstart a project and recruit partners when the world is topsy-turvy and people already have many commitments on their plate. 
We've also realized that flexible deadlines are even more important at this period of time. And I think Don spoke to that earlier. And uh, finally, the COVID-19 project has offered us kind of a, a really valuable and alternative opportunity to stay engaged with the community while we work together to kind of create this collaborative or multi-perspective history of our region uh, to share with future generations. And then the last slide, please. So we just wanna um, thank, um, thanks to all of our community partners, um, our community um, oral historian partners, our artists uh, who have partnered and worked with us. And they're all listed here and we're looking forward to the next phase of the project. And I hope our presentation offers some encouragement for those trying to work on collaborative projects right now um, with these kind of processes and timelines that are seeming to shift and transform. So thanks so much um, for everybody for listening. I'm glad you're here. And 1141, with that, we'll go on to the next presentation. Thanks, RB. Thank you. Okay, we're going to transition now um, to uh, a presentation by Beth Weigel, who is with um, the Juno Museum, Juno Douglas City Museum, and uh, for her presentation. So Beth, take it away. Thank you, Gunesh Jish. I'm joining you here today from Akkwan Shinke Ani, and also known as Juno. And um, my presentation today, I'm, I'm focusing a little bit on some of the, the things that we did to respond to the pandemic at our museum, at the Juno Douglas City Museum. And um, I've titled it Virtual Dynamics in Museums and how we're kind of looking a little deeper at, than just at engagement through these various things um, and a little bit more into ideas like equity and diversity and inclusion and, and um, uh, access. And when I talk about virtual dynamics, I guess I'm thinking a little bit about the forces or properties that stimulate growth and development or change within a system or a process. So um, we're probably all familiar with a lot of these. Um, and we all made it here today. So, so we're learning how to navigate and adapt to some of these virtual technologies. Um, and they're obviously shaping the way that we're doing things now. And one of the things I think, one of the reasons I think I was somewhat invited to be in this panel is because word got out that we had a double robotics robot, which you see in this screen here for tours. And it definitely changed engagement for us. Um, funny little, furthest flung uh, connection we made was in Australia because someone had heard about that. And um, I also am including here um, this uh, quote by Elizabeth Merritt, who's uh, Vice President of Strategic Foresight and the founding director for the Center for the Future of Museums at the American Alliance of Museums. And it's finally to ensure their own survival, museums must quickly become more efficient and effective, which means confronting the digital reckoning many have long delayed. And I think We've all toyed around with different technologies in our museums and um, there's a gap that maybe we are trying to fill a little bit more quickly here because of the given circumstances. Um, and so that's a little bit about what I'm gonna present for you today. And um, hmm, there we go, whoops right ahead. There we go. So our story is probably not unlike a lot of other people's stories. We um, experienced a couple of different closures, um, reduced hours. Um, we had a couple of different things where we tried to make it easier to come in in the summer when we usually have all kinds of tourists that are, are paying to come in. We sponsored free admission through our friends group. Um, and we also had one other big thing happen, which was that as the museum director, and because we're a city museum, I was redeployed and I was asked to come down to City Hall and work with the EOC for nine weeks as a public information officer. So everybody missed me and they put my picture up on my chair, but um, it, it made a huge difference in some of the things that happened at the museum while I was gone. Um, mostly, uh, there was no time to engage with the museum while I was gone. And my direction as I walked out the door was like, keep us relevant, make sure people stay engaged. And, um, and that was while we were closed as well. So 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, we've, we definitely have had some interesting engagements, um, but I wanted to go, kind of go back through some of our uh, virtual dynamics, so to speak, and um, see how we were faring because diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, um, some of these tenants put forward here by the American Alliance of Museums, have been a really important part of, of, of the work we've been doing lately. And um, you can check those out on the American Alliance of Museums. But a lot of these are really reaching to help us uh, reframe what we're doing um, by making sure that we're having adequate representation, making equitable programming, um, making sure that um, we're recognizing past exclusion and achieving some more genuine inclusion, um, making sure that it's, you know, this new sort of virtual world we're in, um, accessibility we often think of as the accessibility for buildings and things like that, but there's different sorts of things to think about in this new virtual world. And uh, just making sure that um, we're, we're inclusions and in making sure that the perspectives of disenfranchised people have, are being heard. Um, another really driving part of my presentation and what I was working towards in thinking about some of these things is a new report that's out by the American Alliance of Museums called, it's one of the Trends Watch um, things and uh, it's called Navigating a Disruptive Future, also by Elizabeth Merritt. And she's really having people think a little bit more or asking people to think a little bit more into the future, obviously, and, and working on a tool called Tools, the um, DEAI and uh, the Trends Watch um, report. I'm using that as my lens to look at some of the things that we did in response. So another little important piece to know about what was going on at our museum right before we closed in uh, March of last year, we were getting, we were just about ready to open a new exhibit called Echoes of War, Unanga Internment during World War II. And it had been a project we'd been working 18 months on, connecting with uh, partners throughout the state, including those on the Pribilof Islands. Um, we were mostly focused on Funter Bay, which is where the folks uh, on the Pribilofs were interned. There were other camps throughout Southeast for other um, islands of the Aleutians. And uh, our exhibit was meant to be very immersive because there wasn't a whole lot of material culture um, left from that event. So we have lots of pictures, lots of, we even built a little cabin that would represent what, what people's experiences might've been when they were um, removed and interned in Funter Bay. So that all was like, oh my gosh, is this gonna still happen um, after we, we closed. Um, we, did re we did open back up in June and we had the exhibit up. We also decided to extend the exhibit through this summer into 2021. It also meant people from the Pribilofs couldn't come down. Um, there were other in, um, initiatives as part of this working group we've been working with for 18 months, including um, you know, a, a bill to protect the, the grave site in Funter Bay and some interpretive signs that will be placed out in Funter Bay. So, and people were gonna come and, and be part of that ceremony as well, but all those things obviously put on hold. So we started to think about how we could continue some of the programming around this exhibit. And uh, Zoom is one of our new virtual dynamic tools that we're using. And so we uh, had a, a discussion, um, panel discussion with people on island as well as uh, Martin Stepperton, who's up there in the middle, he was here in Juneau, but um, everybody else was up in the Pribilofs. And it was very stressful to try and connect because um, the quality of the broadband up there was not great. And we were worried people would cut in or cut out. And um, the tribe really backed that up um, to help us make sure that everybody had the ability to connect. And uh, we had to, of course, learn all kinds of new things. Um, so that was a really interesting um, experiment with the, the new dynamics that we were dealing in. And uh, it's really, you know, if you're not familiar with, with where things are, this is just one of the examples of, of, from the exhibit of giving a sense of how far, you know, the Pribilofs are from Juno. So it's way out there in the middle of the Bering Sea, the Pribilofs. So with this new challenge, um, I was reading a few different articles and uh, some of the things that I've come across have to do with um, 
the connectivity that happens in rural places. And uh, in, in the reports that I mentioned, um, you know, Elizabeth Merritt notes that the pandemic has made access to reliable, fast internet connectivity more critical than ever. Quarter of Americans don't have high-speed internet access at home, and that rises to one-third in rural communities. I'm sure it's even harder in our Alaskan rural uh, villages and places like that. There was an article um, from the Tribal Business News that talked about um, SpaceX, which this is SpaceX, Elon Musk's SpaceX, which is uh, sort of a hope for bringing broadband into places like Utkavik. Um, a teacher there had written and sort of applied, I think, for um, this, which would be, a, it, was, it was a very reasonable thing, like $100 a month for unlimited plus a $500 uh, equipment fee, um, where normally you're paying like $300 for 10 megabytes. Um, and, uh, you know, there's other things that um, are already in place, but uh, part of that article also, John Wallace, who's a technology provider in Western Alaska, talks about it just being kind of not very fair or equitable in that sense. Um, a company like Middle Mile, for example, have these lucrative companies that provide a service, but it really doesn't, you know, because it's being subsidized by the government, it allows for, you know, something that isn't really equitable, which in rural Alaska might cost $61,000 for 12 megabits. Um, where, but it's being subsidized. So we also, there was also a KTO article um, that talked a little bit about another startup called Alaska Tribal Spectrum. They're getting a grant to do some things to help with broadband. And also during the pandemic, um, some other things that are available for people to help with. Um, the FCC is providing like $50 a month discounts for broadband and $75 discounts for households on tribal lands and some other things like that. So I think there's some links in there for some of those articles. Um, so Zoom, one thing, YouTube was another uh, virtual dynamic we were encountering. Uh, the two times I think my staff contacted me while I was gone, they asked me if they could buy a tripod and they asked me if they could start a YouTube channel. And I said yes to both of them without knowing exactly what they were planning. Um, but they started to make videos and our curator of um, public programs and our curator of exhibits and, and collections just sort of opened up into the collections rooms and started bringing out different pieces. And they did uh, like curator chats around different pieces and guess that artifact and things like that. Um, when I got back, I did a video. We did a series of videos on how to um, make a um, cranky, which is like a, a moving uh, panorama little thing. Um, so we did a lot of that and, you know, introducing video into what we were doing. They, they, we actually had kind of an old camera that worked and, and uh, we were doing okay with that, but we decided to invest in some other things, um, including new camera equipment, which took about $2,000. Um, it, it definitely changed our staff skills, um, both both of these ladies learned to edit uh, video and put videos together. Um, we had to make some decisions about viewing platforms. Obviously, we chose YouTube, uh, but with YouTube, you know, you have to. We have to tell people to search for Juno Douglas City Museum and subscribe because until you get so many subscribers, um, you can't have sort of that shortened link to your YouTube channel. Um, we also kind of, I just knew we were doing this, but I said yes to it without considering our social media policy for the city. Um, and so there were lots of things to kind of uh, think about in that. And I think in the report that I've mentioned, um, she, she talks about a museum's investment in digital tools should be clearly linked to the greater needs, whether those are supporting the daily work of staff, which is what these folks were doing while I was away and, and when I got back improving communications and marketing, which it has done greatly, enhancing our visitor experience, which we are able to you know, put things out and we see lots of people engaging with that and opt optimizing our business operations. And, um, you know, these are the critical kind of choices that we're making as we're thinking about these types of technologies. Um, this is a screenshot of Nico, my curator for collections, uh, talking about a phonograph and um, a couple of other things with videos would help think help us think about accessibility. Um, you'll see that I've put in there the uh, the um, closed caption, and um, this is a little bit about starting to think about some strategic uh, foresight. So 
uh, making sure that we're investing in things that will help us thrive over the next decade. And um, some of these accessibility things that to think about are things like having a, a sign language translator, um, doing ADA transcription, um, closed captions, which are very different than subtitles. Subtitles are usually uh, when we're dealing with a different language and audio description. So these are all tools that should, could and should be used, utilized when um, using this sort of virtual technology. Um, another thing that we quickly jumped on, um, there was a email that went out that said, hey, museums, are you interested in joining us in this project called Museums for Digital Learning? Um, it was a, originally a project funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Services. It's still kind of in its beta, so um, we uploaded uh, we had kits that we had in our museum that teachers would check out. So we converted one of our kits very quickly into this digital um, format for uh, making sure that people had access to the learning tools. But that's a really big gap, I think, um, for museums as well, is this having a platform in which to do these things from these learning platforms. Um, and so this was really helpful for us because we were able to not have to cre recreate this wheel in some way. Um, we also upped our game in Facebook and uh, our past perfect museum software, we went online with that. That helped increase our engagement as well, but it also takes a lot more staff time and you get a lot more emails and questions and um, things like that around these types of things, but it also helped us virtually. Um, one thing that I didn't really do too much on is our store. We did kind of go with our friends group and add a few more things there, but it's just really a big step to, to create a virtual store for your museum, but we're using a little bit of WooCommerce to do that on our friends page. So as we kind of get into this um, end of uh, the first year, you know, when we're looking down the next summer for the summer, we're wondering, are we gonna be canceled <laughs> again? And uh, this is some of the things when we think about foresight uh, strategic foresight. Um, you know, we don't have to have a crystal ball, but we can certainly be connecting and thinking about some of the current events that are going on and thinking about the many things that could happen, um, even if we are, get it a little bit wrong. Elizabeth Merritt says uh, we can still be sort of right. So, for example, tourism could have been disrupted by lots of other things like political or economic sanctions, a collapse of public transportation, rising gas prices. Um, but identifying tourism as a critical vulnerability it can help us uh, to create some strategies. And uh, these are some of the other things that she posted in her, um, her essays and, and whatnot, her report of things to kind of think about when and where these will happen, not if. And she also introduces this thing called the cone of plausibility, which uh, helps us think about some scenarios for the future. They might be growth scenarios, they might be things that constrain us, they might be things that collapse us, and they might be things that transform um, in many ways. And the sort of fun one that she does, and I know you guys are wondering about this robot, <laughs> um, we have had some engagement with it and it's interesting how it's, it's working. I don't think that story's done yet, but as um, we think about the future and this maybe wild card. Uh, one of the things that Elizabeth Merritt sort of presents is this citizen museologists, um, because in the years between now and 2025, uh, maybe we'll replace jobs with robots. And um, then because we have all this like mass unemployment, then uh, we'll implement a universal basic income to meet families' needs for housing and food. And because of that, everybody's gonna have lots of free time. And so they're gonna start volunteering and we'll launch you know, the US Culture Corps and channel those into arts and culture and history and science. And, uh, and that will allow us to pay people a little bit better in the museum world um, instead of very skimpily maybe that happens now. And we'll have all these citizen museologists and um, we'll be able to offer free admission and low cost programs and things like that. And while that sounds kind of wild for the next four years, um, we do use, you use a lot of volunteers in our museum and we do try and create that free admission during this time of crisis. And um, we do take advantage of, of, of the people who can do the interpretation for us when somebody is doing the, the robot throughout the museum. So if you're curious about the robot a little bit more and how it's working, I'll invite you to um, give us a call or email us and schedule your own tour 
and you can see how that's working. So thank you, Gunesh Chish, so much for having me here today. And I'm, I think we might have time for questions. I don't know. Thank you, Beth, for that amazing presentation. We're actually right up against uh, the end of our session. And I do wanna be considerate of everybody's time and the potential need for a break. Um, but I wanted to uh, thank everybody for joining us uh, today, kind of for this two-part programming. Um, also a huge thanks uh, to my co-organizer, Don Bittison, for helping to, to shape this session and to work kind of through the logistics of it. And a huge thanks as well to all of our amazing uh, presenters, um, our artists, our colleagues here in the museum world uh, for your just really um, thoughtful presentations, um, the time that you carved out to share with us and it's just really appreciated. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're gonna break now for a 20 minute, um, 20 minute break. And when we come back, or if you come back to um, room A, this is going to be the talking circle, conducting collaborative community-based participatory research. So I hope you will join in for that. Um, otherwise guys, thanks again. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Take care.